If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to my favorite book in the Bible, the book of James. James 1, verses 2 through 4, I'm going to do a brief overview and then pick up where I left off this morning. The question I'm speaking on today is, can good come out of trials? Can God use trials for good in my life? The Bible says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In Jesus' name, speak to our hearts. For Christ's sake, amen. You may be seated. The theme of the book of James is a faith that works, not a faith and works, a faith that works. One of my favorite statements comes from uh, C.K. Kesterton. He says, Christianity has not been tried and found lacking. It just hasn't been tried. So the Lord Jesus really does desire our faith to be living, visible, and productive. Now this morning, I told you there were four words I wanted to lift from this text that I felt were descriptive words that help us to understand the truth of whether good can come out of trials. And the first word we dealt with was evaluation, where the Bible says, count it all joy. And if you'll just remember this, the word count, the word consider means forward thinking. Forward thinking. The Bible says that Christ considered it all joy, even though he endured the cross, despising the shame, in order to offer us perfect sacrifice for us that was forward thinking it was not that there was joy in the trial but as a result of staying faithful the joy that we read about comes after the trial most trials are extremely difficult Job said he knows the way that I take it was in the midst of the trial when he has tested me I shall come forth as gold and so joy is connected with the capacity and tenacious nature of an individual that says, I'm going to let God help me see it through. The Bible says when you fall, reminding us not if, but when you fall into diverse trials. Trials are in the context of storms, and that is you either are in a trial tonight, you have just come out of a trial, or you're about to enter one. They're inevitable, they're inescapable, and they're unavoidable. Now, when the Bible says when you fall into various trials, it's a word that means you're surprised by the stumble, which means that you don't have time to get ready for it. You just find yourself in it. And Jesus is saying that when you fall into these, consider it all joy, which is calling for an uncommon attitude toward a common experience. We all fall into trials. He refers to the fact that there are various trials because they're multicolored. If we're not careful, you and I will spend our time trying to out-trial one another. When someone tells of their trial, they'll say, you think that's something, which alleviates you of the capacity to encourage the person in their trial because you are more reflective on your trial than whether God could use you to encourage someone in theirs. Or you might, may find yourself saying, that's nothing compared to what I'm going through. Can I say something to you? It is never nothing to a person going through a trial. It is always something to the person going through the trial. And the question is, are you more concerned? Do you have the capacity, like Christ, to be more concerned about others than your own need? Now, I want to just mention this, and then I'm going to give you the second word. I really believe this is the best definition I've ever given this church on trials and temptations. Remember, the word used for trials is the same Greek word in the New Testament, and the only way we can tell whether it's a trial we're in or a temptation is the context. Trial is a testing which comes from the external situation and works itself inward. So here's a trial out there pulling at me, working against me, and it works itself inside. If I don't respond properly to it, I can allow that trial to get the best of me. Temptation, on the other hand, is a solicitation which comes to the inward parts being tempted to do something wrong and works itself out. No wonder the Bible says, guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. So there's something trying to get in here to disturb my relationship with Christ and bring me down. And here's probably the best statement of the morning. The word trial, seems to deal more with the response you choose to make than it does with the severity of the trial. 
Most people, when they're in a trial, they're overwhelmed by the severity of the trial instead of the choice they're going to make and how they respond to the trial. And then the second word I gave you this morning, evaluation, production. God is building something. God is making something. The Bible says in verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And I mention it to you, and there are many of you that are with us tonight that were not here this morning. Notice it says the testing of your faith. It doesn't say the testing of your personality. It doesn't say the testing of your life. It doesn't say the testing of your propensity to sin. It is the testing of your faith. Uh, there is a all-out assault against my personal faith in Jesus Christ. And the word testing in the Greek New Testament translates sterling coinage. In other words, it means sterling coinage in that it's a process where money has all of its alloy removed so that if you've got a nickel, it's all nickel. Silver, all silver. Gold, all gold. When he says knowing that the testing, it means by experience. I have lived long enough. I've been through enough things in my life that I know how this feels. And the testing is a, a proving. And then I just gave you these words as principles. And here's just good words. Uh, troubles do not last. The Bible refers to troubles that come for a little while. All of us could talk about a trial we knew at one time. Uh, trouble serves a purpose, if need be. God will use uh, what Steve and Vicki have gone through very purposefully for his glory and for their good. Trouble brings distress. We can be grieved in the midst of what the trouble has caused. Trouble comes in various forms. Trouble should not diminish the Christian's joy. And the Bible says that it produces patience. That's not the best word. The best word is perseverance because it speaks of no passiveness at all. When the Bible gives this perseverance, it means that I'm able to face things believing that God is working together for my good. So that's where I left off this morning, but with this one statement. Why is the testing of my faith so important? What book gives the greatest examples in all of the Word of God on the testing of the faith? I believe Hebrews chapter 11 does. And it's in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And so a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. And so God puts our faith to the test to prove its genuineness. So with that in mind, let me give you the third word. The third word is cooperation. So now we're picking up from where we left off this morning. And in verse 4, the Bible says, but, but let patience. You notice the permission it's requesting? But let patience have its perfect work. Why? That purposeful statement. You may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. He is calling for cooperation. A, a person is going through a trial, a various trial, all sorts of trials, and he's saying, John, I want you to cooperate with me. But who is this speaking to? In verse number 3, or verse 2, the Bible says, my brethren. Uh, this is what I would call a family secret. In order for trials to accomplish God's intent in our life, we must cooperate with the process, but we must be part of the family. I say it again, if I tried to say to an unsaved person tonight, hey man, if you're going through a difficult time, consider it all joy. He would say, how foolish. And it is foolish if you don't have the Father to help you as a result of being part of his family. I'm grateful that Romans 8, 28 is still in the Bible. It reminds me of this verse. It says, but we know, there again, we know by experience, experiential knowledge, we know that all things work together for good. Wait a minute, to who? To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You can't give that verse to an unsaved person. It's someone who loves God. Now, there's two possible responses when you go through trials. Now, listen carefully. Two possible responses when you're going through a trial. Number one, enduring. I'm just going to trust Jesus, believe this will pass, and believe that somehow with the rest of my life that's left, God will use it for his greater glory. The second thing to do is to escape, and that's trusting self. And that's what you do. You begin to say, I think I've learned my lesson in this. I disagree with the entire process. I won't out. And that's where the majority of people are when they're going through a trial. See, enduring means more than simply tolerating the trial. It means actively putting our trust in God in the midst of the trial. Somebody says, what do you think you're going through? Say, man, I don't understand. I don't know. How long do you think this trial is going to last? I'm not sure. God hadn't told me. And that's the number one question, how long? And then escaping means bailing out of walking by faith. It means running away from a God-given trial 
and the exercise of faith it requires. It requires faith to hang in there and believe God through the trial. I read the cutest illustration. Listen to this. This man was burdened to grow in his patience. Can I get a witness? He knew he was immature in that area of his life. I resemble that remark. And he wanted to grow up. He sincerely prayed, Lord, help me grow in patience. I want to be more self-control in this area of my life. So that morning, on his way to work, he missed his train and spent 50 minutes pacing the platform and complaining of his situation. As the next train to the city arrived, the man realized how stupid he had been, and he said this, the Lord gave me nearly an hour to grow in my patience, and all I did was practice my impatience. So God places a trial in your life, and it may be where you've said, Lord, I wish you would work in this area of my life. God, I'm not satisfied with where I am in this aspect of my life. And God goes to work, sends a sovereign trial into your life to make you more like him. And then we blow the opportunity. Romans 5, 3 says it better than any verse in the Bible. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. So here it is. As we cooperate, he produces. So God's working on you. You're in a difficult time in your life. But could it be that there is a production being conducted and orchestrated by the hand of God in order to make you into a person that would bring greater glory to God and be for your better good? Is that possible? Now, with that in mind, let me give you the fourth word, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time, and I'll try to finish uh, when I'm uh, through. Completion. Evaluate it. Let's look at this thing. Let me see if I can forward think. Uh, This trial doesn't feel good. I can't get out of it soon enough, but I want the process to have the effect Jesus wants it to have. You ever, you ever been concerned about someone that was sick? I mean, just had an overwhelming bad case of the flu, and they took their medicine, went to bed for two days, and jumped up and went right back to work. And you said this to him, Brother, you better get back home getting bed. You're not totally well yet. And then they comes on them the second time, and they're worse off than it was the first time. Well, you may say, yes, yeah, easy to talk about the flu. How about the Christian God's working in their life, and he's not through with them yet. But they're up and they're ready to go. And they're not waiting on the process that God's doing in their life. God wants to bring completion. Notice what he, the words, the language he uses. Let patience cooperate, have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, and ultimately you're going to be lacking nothing. Now there's three key truths that Weirdsby shares. He said we ought to be considering. The term means to lead the way and has the idea of proceeding or going ahead of something. Because joy is linked to the expression, we can conclude that when various trials occur, first and foremost, we're to stay positive, allowing joy to run loose within us. And it's certainly not normal for this to be our first response, but we're expected to cultivate it as much. Then he said the word knowing. In order for us to view our trials with the proper mindset, we have to comprehend their end results and realize that they are not bad for us. Trials are not bad for us. And then the word letting, we're to cease fighting, blaming and surrender, allowing the testing to work its results of maturity. And what is it? It says the perfect work, a maturing process. I mean, that's how we mature. We find ourselves, we stumble. The word of God says in the book of Proverbs that a good man will fall seven times and he'll get up. And sometimes we want to keep them down. This is not plastic fruit being produced. This is a process that takes you on a journey. Let me mention something I've discovered in trials. This is good right here. This may be worth the evening trip. Three things in my own personal life I have discovered in trials. Number one, it leads to a deeper communion with the Lord. You you know what happens when you go through a trial? It reveals the true source of your life. If I am scatterbrained, I feel like I can't make another step until I get into the office of a counselor. And we've got a counseling ministry. I led this church to build it. I love every counselor I've got. But I'm telling you, the chief source of my life for trials is the Lord Jesus Christ. I must get to Christ. Find me a quiet place. Let me get on these knees. Give me a blessed Bible. And then I'll go see the counselor and say, this makes sense. But anyway, deeper communion with the Lord. Number two. 
God uses trials to produce character in me. Number three, I know that trials are growing me into completeness. God says, Johnny, there's still areas of you that look nothing like me, and I'm, just, I'm gonna have to chip them off, and I'm gonna do this all for you. So he uses the word perfect. And that makes us nervous. He wants it to have a perfect work. That means reaching the end for which it was created. That's what it means to be perfect, reaching the end for which it was created. This is the goal of the test. I want Johnny Hunt to reach the end for which he was created. And anyone that doesn't want that for me is less than full of Jesus. So mature at the end of the task. You know what it means? Jesus wants me to grow up. He wants me full grown and then he uses the word entire that means soundness in all of the person's life then he says I don't want you lacking I don't want you lacking that means no defects and no inadequacies it doesn't mean that you've never had any it means that the tests and the trials have worked in the area of your inadequacies and who in Jesus name does not have inadequacies so testing and trials troubles they're God's pruning shears his purging fire his carpenter's bench in order to make us what we need to be every trial can become a God-given opportunity for growing us into the likeness of Jesus Christ Oswald Chambers put it this way every humiliation everything that tries and vexes us is God's way of cutting a deeper channel in us through which the life of Christ can flow Well, I started writing the other day, and I thought, you know, after reading this text, I just went back, and I thought, what have I seen here? And listen to these things I wrote down. Number one, here's some more truths I've learned. I jumped on another trail. Uh, Trials purify faith. See, not everyone that claims to have faith have genuine faith. The book of James, what did I say? The book of James is a faith that works. Let me tell you what James talks about in chapter 2. He talks about a faith that is dead, but he calls for a faith that is dynamic. He says some faiths are dead. He says some faith are as dead as a body in a funeral home without a spirit. So the spirit leaves the body, and the body is dead. And the Bible says that's the type of faith some people have. Well, faith is purified through trials. Listen to Mark 4, 16. Now, let me just set it up for you. Remember Jesus in the parable of the sower, or if you prefer to call it the parable of the soil. Listen to what Jesus said about one of the soils. Mark 4, 16. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. They have no roots in themselves and so endure only for a time. Afterwards, when tribulation or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Number two, trials produce patience. Number three, trials perfect character. They make us mature, whole, eventually no effect. Number four, trials promote communion. They drive us to the source of our life, Jesus Christ. Number five, trials contain purging. God removes that which does not represent him in our life. Number six, trials are purposeful. God has a purpose in our trials. Longfellow said this, the lowest lowest ebb is the turn of the tide. I was raised on the coast. I know exactly what that means. It means when the water is lowest, be encouraged, the high tide is ready to start rising. Another friend, never been a sunset yet, not followed by a sunrise says there's no temptation overtaking it. it's common to us but God but we'll with bear it so a true test of our Christian character, how we respond with our blessing. how we respond with our blessings by the way Jesus had trials Luke 22 Jesus Christ spent said, but you are those who continue with me in my trials. Jesus had some fun during his trial. Wow. The Father sent angels to minister to him in the midst of his greatest hour of trial. John Calvin put it this way. 
submit to supreme suffering in order to discover the, the completeness of joy. We are to persevere in our trials so that the work which God has begun in us might be brought to completion. The Lord does send trials. You may say, Pastor, do you have like a clear biblical record of God literally being the author of a trial sent into a person's life? I really do. And it's one of the clearest in the Bible. Let me read it and make several statements and some concluding statements. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Paul made this statement. Lest I should be exalted above measure. What he's saying is, I believe there was potential where I could have become haughty and arrogant. Why? By the abundance of the revelations. What abundance of revelations? He said on one occasion, God, he don't know whether it was in a dream, in spirit, or in the flesh, Doc, that he actually went to the third heaven. He said it was so overwhelming that God wouldn't let him say a word about it for 14 years. He could have never entrusted me with that. I could have never waited 14 years. But, but he said he couldn't tell anybody. He said it was so incredible. For 14 years, he kept it to himself. He said it was abundance of revelation. He said, so you know what God gave me? God gave me, listen to this, listen to the language. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. You mean God released the enemy to bring something into his life? But he said something was given to me and he said lest I be exalted above measure God has a way of saying you know what I've been so good I need to sort of send a trial into this man's life to bring him down a little it's going to flat my goodness has the potential to ruin him if he doesn't respond right to it he said concerning this thing I pleaded with the Lord three times and the word that's used in the Greek New Testament means that he did it over and over and over again he said that it might depart from me and by the way so much for the prosperity gospel preachers that say all you've got to do is just, you just claim it and command it and you command nothing of the sovereign God. The Bible says he three times said, Lord, let this depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient. What he's basically saying is I'm not going to take it from me. I'm going to give you grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Wait a minute. Therefore, most gladly would I rather boast in my infirmity. Thank God for the flesh. And the thorn therein. Why? That the power of Christ may rest on me. God says, I'm going to leave that there, but I'm going to give you the power of God. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmity, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So then I wrote these four statements. What does uh, trials do, according to Paul? All right, listen to this. Number one. Trials produce humility. Now remember, he was going to be exalted above measure, but God brought him down a notch, didn't he? It produced humility. Trials can humble you. Number two, they produce durability. You find that you can be more durable because the grace of God sustains you in the context of the struggles. Number three, they produce consistency. And I'm telling you, if there is anything needed in my life and in your life as a child of God, we need to learn to be consistent. God help me not to be a roller coaster Christian. Up one day, down the next. Man, just, I want to stay even keel for the Lord Jesus. And then number, listen, number four, trials produce sufficiency. God says when you're weak, you'll be strong. I'll be your sufficiency. The psalmist used a verse, and when I read it in the context of my study this week, I thought, I've never looked at it quite like this. Listen to Psalms 138 and verse 8. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. He said, Lord, I'm, I'm really concerned that I've not been as loving, I've not been as generous, I've not been as kind. Well, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Wait a minute. Do not forsake the work of your hands. The hand of God will be at work in the life of the child of God and working oftentimes in the context of trials, making us into the people he wants us to be. Well, do this. Turn to one verse, and I'll read this, and I'm through. Turn to 2 Thessalonians. You're going to need to go back to the left in your Bible if you're in James. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 3. Paul said, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith 
grows exceedingly, which means your faith is greatly enlarged. And the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. God's really working in your life. You're starting to love each other more, and your faith has been greatly enlarged. How's faith greatly enlarged? Oftentimes through the test that God allows to come to our faith. And then he says this in verse number uh, four. Well, in verse four he says, so that, that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith. And all, here it is, and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Your faith has been enlarged, and you've gone through all these tests. God's enlarging your faith. Now, turn over to chapter 3 in the same book, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and look at verse 5, our last verse. He says, now the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. And the patience that speaks of there is the steadfastness of Christ. He's directing our hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. God, God wants me to be steadfast. I mean, he, he really wants me to allow him to be the anchor of my soul uh, so that when the winds and the currents of this life come in the form of trials, I would be so anchored that I could, sp I could be steady and I could endure what God sends.